Now, it's 29 years since the environmental and political activist Ken Sarawiwa was executed by Nigeria's last military dictatorship. His group, the Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People, or MOSOP, had argued that oil production had devastated the region's environment while bringing no benefit to the people there. Led by Ken Sarawiwa, the Ogoni took up a peaceful national and international protest against the Shell Oil Company and the military regime of General Abacha, forcing Shell to abandon oil exploration in Ogoni land. This turned Mr. Sarawiwa and his acolytes into a menace and a threat for the military government. In 1994, Ken Sarawiwa was arrested allegedly for being responsible for the deaths of four Ogoni tribal leaders. And in November 1995, he and eight of his fellow activists were hanged by the Abacha regime. Today, 29 years on, Ken Sarawiwa has become a global symbol for environmental protection and human rights. But what has his death brought to his Ogoni people by way of reparations and restitution? What has changed since his brutal execution in November 1995? Well, for more on this, I'm joined now on the line from Port Harcourt by the National Coordinator of the Ogoni Solidarity Forum, Celestine Abobari. Uh, Mr. Abobari, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, what do you remember of that horrible day in November 1995 when Ken Sarawiwa and his colleagues were executed? Well, on that, um, on that very sad day, I was um, on the plantation at Rizan Palm. Rizan Palm is an oil palm plantation owned by the River State Government in, in Obima. I was the union chairman, um, Agricultural and Earlier Workers Union of Nigeria at the local branch. So um, the accountant of Rizan Palm was in Port Harcourt and witness what happened. So they know that I love uh, Kensar Rua so much. They know that I, I'm an activist and that, um, so they were trying to hide the information from me, but you know, I understand a little bit of the query uh, language. So she was saying that they have killed his brother. Don't tell him they have killed his brother. And that changed my mood immediately. I ran to the house to on the television. And as I saw the news on, on, on NTA, and um, it was, I think, one of the saddest days of my life. Because um, these were people that committed no offense than to ask that the right thing be done. And because that had never happened before in our country, where um, men that has contributed so much to the economic uh, development of, of Nigeria will just be matched to the gallows and executed because of oil. It, it, it took my mind back to uh, what happened when a Pontius Pilate was asking his people, do I release the thief to you or Jesus Christ? And they say, no, you can release the thief to us, go and kill him. So that day, Nigeria chose oil over blood, a very innocent blood costly blood. So uh, we have never recovered from that brutal, gruesome murder of our people, including about 2,000 others that were also recklessly murdered in the Ogoni villages when Paul Kuntomo, Obi Omai, and several others occupied Ogoni territory paid by Shell to kill and murder Ogoni people to teach them a lesson for trying to that the right thing be done. Yes, uh, I feel like I need to say sort of commiserations to you once again, even though it's been 29 years, but the way that you've just told that story is absolutely heartbreaking, I have to say. And I knew his son, Ken Sarawiwa Jr. I knew him from England. I knew him in Nigeria. We used to actually go to the gym together in Abuja here um, after, I mean, during the Obasanjo sort of regime. 
Um, and of course, he's now passed away. So I feel like I, I, I do share in your pain um, there. But I mean, clearly, the Ogoni people are still traumatized by Mr. Sarawiwa's death and that of his other activists who were executed with him. Sure. We have not recovered, you know, from, from, from that, that startling act. We have never recovered. And I, I don't think that uh, Ogoni people will ever recover from that, especially because um, this was a conspiracy. Uh, Kesarua was not even anywhere close to where the, the four gun leaders were killed. In fact, um, that place was, was very close to the military base of Paul Kuntumo. So if there is any person to be accused you know, of killing those people, it should be Paul Kuntumo and his men who, who were living next door to where this incident happened. Kesar War was not around, and they know the truth. But I think, it, like I said, it was a conspiracy. They wanted to teach the Ogoni people and other Niger Delta communities a lesson on how not to um, play and toy with um, the heartbeat of the economy, which is oil. Um, in their thinking, they thought that um, after killing Kesar Uwa and the Ogoni people, that uh, the next morning, um, oil will begin to flow. But this is about 33 years after Shell was sacked from Ogoni. And it surprised them that the oil is still under the soil. And the oil is yet to flow because there is so much blood on the oil. Unlike um, other oil uh, in other parts of the Niger Delta, the oil in Ogoni has so much blood on it. And to assess the oil, you will need to remove a lot of blood from it. And Nigeria hands and the oil company are soil with the Ogoni blood so much that um, um, oil will refuse to flow, even if they want to do it. And, I mean, what was it um, that set the Ogoni cause apart from the rest of the other ethnic communities in River State and the Niger Delta? Why was the Ogoni cry and cause the one that captured the imagination of the world when there were other communities from Bielsa to Rivers to Delta that were mired in the same environmental apocalypse, if you like? Well, the truth is that, yes, like you said, uh, we are all embroiled in that kind of um, environment, a mess. But um, um, they say whenever a man wakes up, he starts his day. So the Ogoni woke up and started their day. Uh, um, uh, and the rest that they say is, is, is history. But what made the Ogoni situation so bad was that um, even if we, they claim that we are minority in Nigeria, but I, I think that we are not uh, a minority because we are a distinct ethnic nationality. We are different people with our culture, language, we are different people, entirely different, lumped together for the administrative convenience of whoever that um, uh, brought us together. So you cannot tell me that I'm of the minority. Minority to who? So, um, Kensal, who is well traveled, he saw um, what oil has done to uh, places like Norway, Texas, and what our oil has bettered the life of people. And it compared to what we are going through in Ogoni, especially the very sad incident that happened at Domo in 1990, where community people went to the gate of Shell. You know, every community that they, that they exploit oil in the Niger Delta, you have two countries in one community. Where the oil companies stay is like Europe. You know, 24 hour electricity, good drinking water, and of course, the snaky track of road that you, you, you see in the community is not that they want to build a road, no, where their trucks will pass. So the Boboche community went to the gate of Shell to go and beg for water. And because they are in control of the soldiers and the riot police, they call the riot police on the people. And some ran into the palace of their king, Chivodu, and the, the riot policemen went into the palace and set it on fire, killing the king, killing his children, all his family members, and all those that ran into 
uh, the palace. Akens Saru said, wow, this was coming to Goni, and we better stop it now. We better nip it in the board. I think so, and especially, like I said, since the creation of River State, no Goni has been governor. No Goni has been uh, speaker of the house. No Goni has been chief judge. No Goni has been a deputy governor. Even if we are well educated, even if our people are overqualified for these offices, so definitely something was wrong. So the Ogoni people took stock of this situation and this scenario and, 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 and said that, yeah, uh, it was better you know, to chat a way forward and put their thoughts in uh, uh, um, a report now known as the Ogoni Bill of Rights, what we call the legitimate demands, the Bible of our struggle. And that talked about our culture that was dying. They talked about um, our language that was also dying because if an Ogoni man is going to the university now, you'll be forced to speak Igbo, Aosa, or Yoruba. So what happened to the Ogoni local dialect? It was dying. Then if we talk about uh, political marginalization that I just told you of, then we talked about environmental devastation, where gas was being flared in very close proximity to human habitation, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And you know, Ogoni people are predominantly fishermen and farmers. The fishes do not stay in daylight. So when it is night, it is also daylight in the river. And these fishes have to migrate to places like Boni, where the Ogoni man does not have a sophisticated fishing trawler to go and fish. So poverty was setting in. We can no longer farm because our, 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 our land does no longer support rich harvest. The fishes were no more. Before now, you just come back from, your, from school, you go and get a little catch, make your food eat, and go and get the big one to go and sell. Without feeding the fishes, you just get them and sell. The same, I used to follow my mother to the farm, just three years of cassava and we are gone. Today you will approve one local government and you won't get it. So poverty was setting there, especially in a situation where there is a complete absence of government. You will give Medicare, Medicare to your family people, you will take them to private school because the public school system that these guys benefited from is completely dead. You will, in fact, there are no family that do not have two generators. If you want to, uh, they want to conduct surgery on any person, your family member in the only hospital, you have to charter a, 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 a generator. And so many things were happening and we need to say, okay, if you are looking for a black goat, you have to start uh, very early. That it was better they stop this operation and let's talk about what has happened. Look at them, uh, Oloibri, where they claim that they have shut down their oil well for years. But crude oil is spewing everywhere. The farms, the river, everywhere. Not that they did not uh, properly decommission. So we didn't want that to come to Ogoni. And our wife came, mobilized the Ogoni, and we understood. We trusted him and followed him and said, no, let's talk. You cannot go to London and sign out an oil well in my backyard. You can't do that. And when they are coming, whether it is an, a ripe farm or newly cultivated farm, they brush everything about oil is violent. Right. From, from the seismic attack, from laying on the pipeline, to everything about it, to flaring of gas. So we say no for that madness. If they want to take the oil or they want to do anything, let's renegotiate. Right. Well, you can't I, go to I, London I, and sign out my oil well. Right. I, I don't mean to interrupt you there, but you've said a lot of a lot of things, um, and you know we're glad that you you're, you're able to express yourself quite volubly the way that you are. But we hear that Ogoni youth are now demanding the resumption of full oil exploration in Ogoni land. I mean, what's your reaction to that? Because apparently they believe it'll lead to the economic rebirth of Ogoni land. Well, we are in an era of renewed hope. <laughs> so, but I can tell you that that is a lie from the, the pit of hell. Because you, you need to tell me or show me which community in the Niger Delta that oil is flowing that have been bettered. Show me one community that has uh, portable drinking water or electricity, or the people enjoy anything because they have oil. If there were no oil in Ogoni, Kensar we will be alive. Our flourishing fishing business will be on. 
the women will be picking their parents and making their money. Oil has brought doom to the Ogoni people. And I dare the federal government, I dare them, because I'm seeing um, private jets coming into Ogoni, carrying people and flying them out and giving them dollars and this and that. I dare them. There is a struggle. There is an ongoing struggle. When Nigeria returned to democracy in 1999, there were two issues plaguing Nigeria, June 12th and the Ogoni issue. June 12th had been settled perfectly well. In fact, they had to go to prison to, to beg over and judge become president. The last administration honored N.K. Wabiola as a former president of this country. He has the highest honor. No such thing has been done to the Ogoni people. The government will need to apologize to Ogoni for invading the peaceful community and butchering everybody and killing everybody. I want to see Ubi Umai and all others that kill the Ogoni people on trial. I want to see them on trial. I want to see all the things that we ask for, our legitimate demands that other Nigerians are already enjoying in abundance. How many oil wells in Abuja? Look at what oil wells has done. The cancer who has what we call a memorial bus, a memorial bus that human rights activists in UK donated in honor of cancer in 2015. They sent that to Nigeria. Why the thing arrived in Nigeria? It was confiscated by Ahmed Ali, the former custom boss, because he was the only military officer on the tribunal that sent him cancer who to death. They seized it and went to the National Assembly, petitioned um, Nkemo Bonta Committee, and they, as, and, and they went to the House of Weho and recommended that that boss be given to us unconditionally. That boss does not have tire, it does not have an engine. I have to go to court in the Koyi, Lagos, since 2017, until April 2023, when I got a judgment that that should be released to us. We took the paper, the judgment, to the customs. Up to now, that has not been done. I'm hearing that the new custom boss has sold that item, but it, it is a lie. Because you cannot say something that we have a valid court judgment. That, I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think it is true anyway, because we have approached um, um, SAM Falana, and we are working on something because we have right. a valid court judgment. I think okay. that they can they cannot dare that. So I think that if they want to dare the Ogoni people, let them match their machines. I know they are put, they are bringing um, uh, uh, they are they are private jets. They are bringing money. They are employed. They claim that they have employed somebody that is lobbying Ogoni people and bribing, right. carrying low, vocal voices to Abuja. They should dare, they, they should dare it. Okay. Unless they want to dig another man's grave. Well, we Tinubu, don't, we don't at the want back, that, at the back we? of President Tinubu we, is a wound. We, we certainly no, don't want to. At the to... back of President Tinubu, there is an injury. He was, he was part of our struggle, and he knows it well. Right. They more perfectly settled the Ogoni issue the way they settled the Yoruba issue. Okay. There is well, a struggle. You, I think you, there is an ongoing struggle. Point, they uh, will settle you, that. Yeah, you've made that point very, very firmly, and um, I, I do... Um, commiserate with you and um, I'm sure a lot of people who are watching um, will be sharing um, certainly their sympathies with what has gone on in Ogoni land and beyond the Niger Delta and other parts of Nigeria. Um, I want to thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, Celestine Abobari is the national coordinator of the Ogoni Solidarity Forum and you were speaking to me on the line there from Port Harcourt and helping us to remember Ken Saru, we were 29 years after his execution. That's it for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and Port Harcourt. Bye bye and thank you for watching.